Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your love for us. We thank you for your uh, blessings, which are new every day, Father. We ask forgiveness of our sins. We fall short of your glory. And it's, it is only because of the blood of Jesus that we're able to stand in your presence, Father. So help us never to forget that um, as Israel was terrified at the foot of the mountain, let us always be fearful that you are consuming fire. And at the same time, Father God, we have boldness to come into your presence because of our perfect mediator, the God-man Jesus. And so now as we study your word, may we see deep and new truths about the book of Revelation. May, may this lead us to, to into worship, into resting in the gospel every day, into living out these truths. Um, both in our thoughts and our actions and, and for our neighbors around us, Father God. And lastly, I pray that you would protect our interpretation. May we interpret the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and begin. I did want to, because there's some new, there's some new uh, people here, and I just wanted to, again, give a plug. Uh, this is not an advertisement. We don't really advertise what we're doing uh, because we don't want a lot of trolls and various... <laughs> So we don't, I don't advertise what we do on social media platforms. The purpose of using social media is really to connect the student with the information and the learning process. So that's kind of the thinking here. So just a quick plug, not for advertising. So, um, you know, if you, if you feel lead to share this with others, that's completely fine. But we're not really publicly advertising this because it's, it's more for the student's benefit. And, um, so just really quick, we have a Facebook page, Interpreting the Word. We post all our videos on that page. And so this page here really connects students or people that are, that are involved in our classes with all the information. We post notes, we post videos. Um, these videos are actually on our YouTube channel. And so this is our YouTube channel homepage. So you can search Interpreting the Word on YouTube. You can also uh, click from, the, from the, the Facebook page. And so then we have, we have different playlists here for different sets of videos. So for, so for this class, the benefit would be interpreting Revelation. So I'm just going to click on the, the full playlist. Everyone can see it here. If I click on the full playlist here, we have the first two sessions that we've already done. So those who are coming in late, uh, even someone who might, a friend or someone that you know is like, I want to join, but I'm, I've, it's two months behind. That's fine. They can, they can catch up watching these videos. And so the benefit is that really if, if, you, if you don't have the foundation as we study the word, the book of Revelation, then it's going to be difficult when you get thrown into the middle. So that's kind of the reasoning behind uh, spending the time and posting these videos. And then we're also posting uh, overview pages for, for the class. So that's kind of uh, the backup to help, to help you. So for those who are just coming in, yeah, so the, the, those, those resources are there for you to, 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 to use any time. Okay, so uh, we are interpreting Revelation, and so this is just kind of a, a, a graphic to kind of visualize what we're doing here. And so we're doing the action of interpreting, and the object, of course, is Revelation. And I did just have, this is not a big PowerPoint, it's just one, one slide, but there are several things that as I was thinking about this morning and preparing, I was taking my, my dog on a walk. And I, and I kind of had a, a revelation. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a little more Pentecostal now. Pastor is, is bring, making me more Pentecostal. But um, just some ways that we should be considering and how we should be reading Revelation. So I have six things perhaps I'll add as the Spirit leads us. But I, I want us to be reading Revelation through several lenses, through considering several things. The, the first is doxologically. So you say, what is doxologically? Uh, we, we could think about the word doxology. And this is, this is in, through a lens of worship, thinking that our interpretation, our reading should always lead us to worship. And mm -hmm. as you'll see in the book of Revelation, the, the central focus is the, is, is the throne room of God. We'll see that in Revelation 4 and 5. And uh, in that throne room, uh, you have creatures worshiping God, the spirits, and, and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. You have, eventually you'll have the nations 
in Revelation 7 and other places, worshiping God. And so, um, and then of course, that all comes down in the end in, in Revelation 21, 22, the, the, the heavenly Jerusalem, Jerusalem descending. And so I want us to be reading what, what this is not he, I'm right, they're wrong, or, or they're, you know, I'm wrong, I need to change. I, I want us fundamentally to read the book of Revelation doxologically. Uh, secondly, I want us to read it theologically. So uh, there is some theological truths. I, I also want to distinguish between foundational theological truths and more debated interpretations. So actually tonight, we're going to sift through uh, core theological truths and then more debated ones. And so I want us to be thinking, uh, reading it theologically accurate and distinguishing between non-negotiable theological truths and some that are debated, okay? Uh, thirdly, I want us to be reading it practically. So we read the famous blessed statement, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy and blessed are those who hear and keep the words of this prophecy for the time is near. So practically refers specifically to going from the mind, going from the heart into our daily lives. And so how can we read the book of Revelation practically? As of yet, the only command is to read, to hear, and to obey. So, so those right now are the specific commands. So practically, we are being called to read, to, to listen, and to obey. So in our family devotions, we're actually reading the book of Revelation. So uh, just, just a thought there. Uh, three more ways. We should be reading it exegetically. So there is always a balance between the exegesis, what the text actually says, and the, uh, theology or what it means. Okay, so, so these two are, are in play. Uh, sometimes people solely read it theologically, and so they actually import other theolo theology outside, and they, and, and, and they actually take away from the meaning of what the text actually says. So we need to be reading it theologically, but also exegetically, what it actually says, allowing the, the exegesis to teach us as well. And so uh, it balances the two. It balances the two. Um, uh, next, we need to be reading it evangelistically. Now, the immediate thinking of this is, oh, we need to go out and share the gospel. But, but, and, and, and that could be true because the, 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 the message of Revelation, you'll see later, an angel is proclaiming the gospel to all creation. So there is a component in which, in which, this should cause us to share the gospel with those around us. Okay, so that's one sense in which we are to be reading it evangelistically. But the second sense, which we don't really think about, and, and I really want us to start seeing this more and more, is that the gospel is not just for our conversion, but also our sanctification. And a foundational passage in scripture that teaches that is um, uh, uh, Romans 1, 16 to 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, or I am confident in the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in the gospel, God's righteousness or God's salvation is revealed from faith for faith, because it has been written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so this statement of living by faith is the very, uh, you are, you are, trusting in the gospel. You are trusting in Christ himself. And so reading it evangelistically is not just concerning our conversion or even sharing the good news with others, but also sharing the good news with ourselves. And so things get crazy. In, <laughs> things get crazy in Revelation. They get pretty crazy, right? There's some pretty crazy visions. There is this temptation to fear, uh, to, to fear and tremble in, there is, there is a good component of fear and a bad component of fear, right? So we should fear when we see the poison label on, on, a, on a medicine, right? There should be a healthy fear. Okay, I need to be careful in handling the medicine. There, there is a place when fear moves from a healthy to an unhealthy. And so the gospel is the remedy for an unhealthy fear. Okay, so we need to be reading it uh, evangelistically, not just in, perhaps in sharing the gospel to others, but also for our daily health and 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 um, uh, um, daily health and also spiritual health and emotional health. And if you are looking at the news, if you're looking at the news right now, with what's going on in our country? Uh, the remedy for a possibly a, a bad fear or 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 an unhealthy fear is the gospel. And so we need to be 
assuring ourselves, resting in Christ, finding our identity in Christ. Lastly, we need to be reading it canonically. So that's kind of a big word like, Tim, what in the world does can it, can not, <laughs> canonically mean? What, what is that? That's a big word. And, and so we, um, uh, and all that is to say is that we're reading it in the context of all of Scripture. There is a ton of Old Testament references, uh, not just explicit citation, but also parallel ideas. Many times Revelation takes images from the Old Testament and just applies it to the future. And so um, as we read Revelation, we need to be reading it in the context of all of Scripture, especially the Old Testament. So canonically, we should be reading the Scripture canonically, all right? And so um, uh, if you want to just use another word, reading it considering Old Testament and the teachings of Jesus, you can say that. You know, we need to be considering these other things, all right? So uh, without further ado, let's go into the into the Word of God. And so if you will, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 1 because we're finishing up our study in the introduction of the, the book. And it is very, uh, I want us to reset the table. I want us to, to, to familiarize ourselves with what has been said before, okay? And I want us to be thinking specifically as I read this it, with the relationship of Jesus Christ and God the Father. And I want us to be to be thinking about, um, uh, especially in, in, in Revelation verses 6, Revelations 5 to 9. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the rulers of the kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to our God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Even so, amen. I am the, the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Okay, all right, so um, just several by way of, of review. We notice here that um, John is writing to the seven churches, uh, but, but the use of seven, so these are seven literal churches, but they're all, the, the seven is also this, this idea, this symbol of, of perfection, completion, and so it's not just to those seven churches, but to the church itself. And we see that in the connection between the two sevens, the seven spirits who are before the throne. So it's not that there are seven literal spirits, but that this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And the connection between the two is between the use of seven. Okay. And so actually Luigi highlighted that last week. He made that observation. And, and, and I really want to, I, I, when I watched the video again, I, I felt that I wasn't really clear. The use of seven is number one for perfection. Number two, because of the connection between the two. So it's highlighting that the spirit is present in all the church. Okay, so there is this unity and there is this, 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 this strong connection there. The second thing that we want to see is that the grace and peace is coming from, from the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's in contrast to the wrath and judgment that is to come. So as we read Revelation, we should not have fear because God has is giving to us, we are the objects, the church is the objects, grace and peace, not wrath and fury and judgment. And so that should be a huge comfort to us before the words of the prophecy are given to us of what is to come. The next thing I want to highlight is that Jesus Christ is described in three different ways. Number one, he is the faithful witness. Number two, he is the firstborn from the dead. And number three, he is the rulers of the kings of the earth. And so faithful witness... Uh, 
maybe after this class, I, I've, I've made statements before. I haven't made promises because sometimes I run out of time. But um, the faithful witness idea is actually this proclaiming truth. And Jesus actually says in John 19 to Pilate, I came in to the world for this purpose, to bear witness to the truth. So ironic, not ironically, uh, providentially, in John's gospel uh, account, the same author, John's gospel account, the fundamental purpose of Jesus coming was to bear witness to the truth and not provi providentially, not, not ironically, not by chance, John describes Jesus fundamentally as the faithful witness. <laughs> so Jesus' purpose is to bear witness to the truth. And here in, in the Revelation, he is the, the, the faithful witness, the one bearing witness to the truth. Um, secondly, uh, he is the firstborn of the dead. And the, rule, uh, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The firstborn of the dead really highlights that he is the first of the new creation, the incorruptible uh, creation. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It must become incorruptible. It must become imperishable. And so there is this transformation when Christ is raised from the dead that because he is forever the God-man, in this transformation now he is the first fruits of the new creation i'll also maybe i'll also i'll also in doing a handout of other passage references i'll also include that as well and then thirdly we see that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth and so many times people will refer to jesus as the future ruler the one who is to come and for sure we see his reign consummated completed brought to completion in revelation but Fundamentally, the question is, is Jesus on the throne now or just in the future? And we, we must strongly push against anyone who denies the kingship of Jesus now. Jesus is the ruler of the kings on earth now. And the one passage of scripture that we highlighted was Matthew 28, 18 to 20. I think Pastor uh, made, made that connection. Uh, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Has been given, past tense. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, okay? Um, and then we talked about, we talked about uh, this doxology that's given to Jesus. And the doxology is to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins and, uh, by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to our God and Father, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so here it, it, it describes three acts of Jesus. And then there's this uh, glory, uh, uh, this doxology, this uh, attribution of glory and kingdom forever. Now, what I actually saw this in another class that we're teaching. In the Old Testament especially, God will often reference his acts prior to a call to action or prior to a command to worship. Okay? And so here we actually see Jesus, just like God, his acts are described, and then the call to worship is given. To him be glory, dominions forever and ever, amen. Uh, secondly, we talked about this. This, would, this is heresy. This is blasphemy if Jesus is not God himself. Okay? And so this, this is, uh, so if we're, if we're reading this theologically, uh, we need to see the Trinity here. So that's a first fund fundamental truth. Secondly, we need to see the, the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. So first born from the dead, humanity. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Divinity. So here we need to see Jesus's divinity. And here we need to see Jesus's humanity. Jesus is the God, the, the God man, the eternal son of God, and the physical man, Jesus Christ. So uh, 100% man, 100% God. Okay? Now, now we're getting into the new stuff here, and this is going to be, this is going to be good. This is going to be really good. And I want us to continue with this theme of the, of the divinity of of the divinity of, of 
of Jesus because it's going to be quite significant here. So let's go ahead and let's look down here at verses 7, 8, and 9. I'm going to focus right now. I'm sorry, 7 and 8. We're only going to do two verses today. If you're going to say, Tim, this is crazy, right? Again, I want to emphasize that we're going slow because this is the introduction and this is actually setting up the context for the rest of the book. So we need to take our time. We need to read it doxologically, theologically, practically, uh, exegetically, evangelistically, and also canonically. So we're going to read verses eight and nine with all of those senses here. Okay, so let's read it here. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those whom he, uh, who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So actually, I should, let me take a step back. Let's make observations from these two passages. And let's look at, let's look at both verses 7 and 8. Because there are some parallel words in verses verses 7 and 8 that I want us to consider, at least one. So let's go ahead. Let's, let's make some observations. Let's ask some questions. Pastor Tim? Go ahead. I guess one thing I would say is when it talks about even those who pierced him. So in other words, even those who did not believe uh, will actually see him. So they have no choice. They're, they will have to see him. No. Every eye. Yeah. So, okay, great. So, so let's let's look let's let's focus in on here. Let's make some several. That's great. So number one, there is this this action here, and then the statement: the actor is every eye, okay, and the object is the object is Jesus, and then your. Your big statement here, which is really good, is this This is a clarification, right? He's clarifying what he means by every eye, right? What is the every eye? And that clarification is those who pierced him. Right? So John is thinking that they will think, oh, this is this is a reference to what does this refer to? Right? That's the question. Combining this, this is all people. without exception. And we could say, we could say believers and unbelievers. Great, excellent. Excellent observation. So let, let's, let's do something here. This, let, let, let's make one more observation here. This is, uh, a, a pu this, is, this is very public, right? Everyone agree with this? If every eye is seeing him, it's a public. It's a public, it's a public coming. Everyone tracking with me there? Yes. Yes. As long as there's clouds in the sky. What was that? As long as there's clouds in the sky. <laughs> so let's go ahead since you mentioned it. So he is coming. He is coming. Now with the clouds, how can we, how can we, how can we define this? 
with the cloud. To me, that sounds like that sounds like certainty. Okay, yes. So there is certainty there. It, could we also say that specifically with the clouds, this is dealing with manner, the manner by which he comes? With the clouds. Now, um, this is an inner, oh, I'm sorry. So, so yeah, so let's, let's, what you said was really good and I, and I messed this up here. Excellent. So I'm going to put certainty here and this is going to be certainty right here. Now, the, who is the he? Who is the he? Now, this might sound stupid, but I, I want us to identify this. Who is the he? Jesus, right? Yes, excellent. So, we're, so that's very important where we're going with that. Okay, so Jesus is coming. He's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see them, even those whom he pierced. Now, are, are we afraid of clouds? Are you afraid of, are you afraid of a cloud, clouds? If I'm up there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the size of cloud. <laughs> and the color of the cloud. And what it forms, yep. Yeah. It's dark and scary. So this could be a reference to What's the biggest cloud that you've experienced? I've never experienced a funnel cloud, but that's probably pretty big, right? Yeah, I didn't even think about tornado. Tornado? What else? Beth, you're one friend. I, 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 I have a, uh, I have eye cloud. <laughs> oh my word! <laughs> <laughs> What other what other type of clouds? Beth, Bethany, one of your friends is terrified of clouds. Thunderstorms. There you go, thunderstorms. That's not a cloud. That's why I said it depends on the type of the color of the cloud. We're not meteorologists here. What yeah, else? Cirrus, <laughs> a cirrus cloud? A cirrus cloud? A, what are they? Nimbus clouds? What are they called? Give me a little cloud? nimbus cloud. Wow, yeah. impressive. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so what, what else? What other clouds are we, we – I'm thinking of one that I'm, I, I've been terrified of. Hurricanes. Huh? Anyone who's been in a hurricane, if you've been outside, you've been terrified. I've been outside terrified that I was going to hit and be killed. Um, uh, we just had several typhoons come through here with, mm -hmm. with Yolanda. I mean, it was pure terror. Okay. But is that wind? Isn't that winds? I know. Can you or see? Is that clouds? It's, That's so, what I was thinking. So it's, yeah. it's this storm. It's a storm. Storm. Okay. So again, think about this. We're, this is a perfect example. This is a perfect example of a perfect example of, of we are scientific. So we understand, oh, well, wind is separate from. Think about being in a pre scientific world. You don't have meteor me meteorological data. When you see the typhoon, when you see the tornado coming, how would you identify it? How would you dis distinguish it from another set of clouds, the thunderstorm? Do you see how there's not really a difference between wind? The, the wind people would think comes, the wind comes from the clouds. Does everyone see that? When the, the presence of a, of a storm coming Everything's just identified as one and the same. Everyone's seeing that there? You're saying, Tim, maybe, you're saying, Tim, maybe that's an exaggeration. Maybe that's an exaggeration, Tim. I think you're reading into this too much. Um, so where would we go to see a context of, of people who were, afraid how would we how would we go to validate our interpretation where would we want to go to this is a this is an exegetical question where would we want to go to i'm, I'm just thinking generally not into a specific but just generally where would we want to look to, to confirm or to deny what i'm saying where would we want to go 
I mean, biblical reference, you say? So the word of God. We want to look at other the Old Testament. In which, <laughs> in which, in which there's, there's a cloud. So, so this is canonically now. Now we're going to go canonically. We're going to go into scriptures. So let's go in our, let's, let's turn in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 19. Now, if you notice, we've already made the identification that Exodus, Exodus 19 was quoted. Where was, as you're turning in your Bibles, where, where did we identify a quotation from Exodus in this context? Does anyone remember from our notes from last week? You better write this down then. Exodus 19.6, right? The reference to, uh, he has made us a kingdom, priest to our God. Right? Exodus 19. So not, let's, let's go ahead. I'm going to read Exodus 19. Is everyone tracking with me? I, I feel as if I'm, I'm disconnected here. Is everyone tracking with what I'm saying? The Exodus 19.6 and, and our discussion of, of, of being fulfilled in the church. He made us a kingdom priest to our God. I'm going to go ahead and read Exodus 19. No, we'll, so that's, that's a citation. That's a citation um, of, of Revelation 1.6. But I'm going to read Exodus 19 to us, okay? And as I read you're going to see several things. Notice what is going on here. So we already know that Exodus 19 is in the mind of John because he's quoted Exodus 19.6 in Revelation 1.6. Okay, so at least we know for fact that's on his mind. Now, now listen to this. On the third moon after the people of Israel had gone out of Egypt, on the land they came into the wilderness of Sinai, they set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, okay? While Moses went up on the mountain, the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, this is the quotation, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So that's the quotation. <laughs> that's the quotation, right? So that's, that's just in our passage, okay? Now watch this. After God makes this, this covenant and this promise to them, it's a conditional promise and covenant, right? What happens next? Watch. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. So Moses is a mediator. He goes to God. He goes to the people. The people says, all this we're going to do, okay? Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and may also believe forever. And when Moses told the words of the people of the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and make them holy, consecrate them, make them holy today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. <laughs> third day, wow. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. <laughs> Every eye will see him. <laughs> Do you see all these references? It's just coming out of everywhere. You shall set limits for the people and all around saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch it, but he shall be stoned or shot, whether beast or man. He shall not live. The trumpet will sound. They will come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. And on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick, so there's thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke. This is from a cloud. <laughs> what kind of cloud is this? And because the Lord had descended on it in fire, 
The smoke went up and like the smoke of a kiln, and the mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered to him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called to Moses to the top of a mountain, and Moses went up. The Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through the, to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. So think about this. Let's go back to our context. Behold, <laughs> he, <laughs> Jesus, the Lord is coming, not a cloud. God, the Lord the first time descended with a cloud. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. If the people were terrified, Exodus 19, what do you think's happening now? Let's make some connections here. I think you're still in Exodus 19. What are some parallels? Let's make some parallels here. Let's look at Exodus 19. And then Revelation 1, 6 to 9. What are some parallels? And what I'm going to submit to you is that there's one context and here's another context. This is Rev and this is Exodus. Give for me some parallels between these two. Let's write them out here. I'll give one, a cloud. Clouds. So there's a ratcheting up. What else? What are some other parallels or some slight ratcheting up or clarifications? What else do we have? I guess the group of people. At first it was just the Israel Israelites and now it's everyone. Yes, okay, let me let me let me make it fix here. Excellent. That's an excellent point. So here you have you have Israel. And here you have the world, right? We're just going to make that. We're going to make that conclusion. It's clear, right? Every eye will see him, those who pierced. And then here we have the third reference. I'm just going to call it out right now. So if ever you were confused about what's being referenced, all the tribes. So you have every eye will see, even those who pierced. All the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, right? So there's... There's, we just need to make that ratcheting up. It's not just a cloud, it's clouds. It's not just Israel, it's the world, okay? And this would be, of course, um, believers and unbelievers. What else do we have? What are some... Maybe even the same statements. What are some same, same, same statements? Does everyone see that? The Lord comes in Exodus. Jesus is coming, right? Diva, there's this. What else do we have? Can we add here? There's a promise. There's a promise of a kingdom of priests, right? 
Yeah. There's a fulfillment. Fulfillment in church. To him be glory, dominion forever. He has made you a kingdom priest to our God. So whereas there's a promise, if you obey, you will be the main kingdom. Now there is this, the kingdom exists in time and space. What else do we have? There's more. What about fear? Is there fear in both people? Trump. They stumble. Yeah, yeah. What about in the other? What about Revelation context? They will mourn. Wailing. They will mourn. There's, there's wailing, wailing. Yes, excellent. We can say mourning or wailing. What else do we have? Trumpets. Yeah, so there's, um, there is this, uh, the, um, hold on here, let me see. In Exodus, there's a, there's a trumpet that uh, it says it's, it grew louder and louder. And yeah. in Revelation 6 to 9, it, it mentioned like, a, a trumpet as well, like. Oh um, no, that's so good! I did not even see that. That is so good. I thought of that. That is so yes. good, Ati Lani. I missed that. Excellent. Where is that? <laughs> Seven trumpets. That's so good. Yeah. Oh, I thought goodness. of that, but I didn't say it because it wasn't. In Where is the trumpet in in uh? <laughs> in Exodus. The, in verse 19, the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Yeah, and, there's a in trumpet. and actually, that's excellent because in other passages, if we have time, we'll go there. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he's going to descend from heaven with the trump of God, with the shout of the yes. archangel, right? So there's, yes. Also, yes. there's going to be this. Let's, let's add this passage in here. Oh, I'm getting excited right now. This is really good. This is good. I am so happy right now. So this is going to be First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. There was a lot of coffee this morning. Yeah, I did. I I'm on my second like cup. I'm on my second cup. Hot. Ah, hold on here. Let me find this. Oh, this is so good. I'm just happy. Okay. For us, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we declare this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend <laughs> from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. So we know that in the now it's not accented here. It's going to be accented later, in, as Alani said, Revelation six to nine. But there is also this trumpet, this this blowing of the trumpet. Excellent, uh, excellent. So let's write down First Thessalonians chapter four, verses verses thirteen to eighteen. Now I'm. Look, there's for sure going to be more comparisons. I'm thinking about one more big comparison here in this context. What's one more big comparison in this context? There's one other action here. What about I, I, the I? Here. People cannot see him. The revelation of Jesus Christ, everyone will see him. Do you see that? I mean, think about that. Think about that. In Exodus, no, you, you cannot, you will be instantly destroyed. If you, anyone, who, anyone who sees or even comes in onto the mountain will be destroyed instantly. But now everyone will see him, and they wail because of the judgment that's coming upon them.
Now, let's look at the cloud. With the cloud, the cloud is just stated with the clouds. Let's describe the cloud. In Exodus, what, what accompanies the cloud? What accompanies the cloud in Exodus? Thunder and lightning. What else? It says thick cloud. Smoke. Smoke. Fire. 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 What happens throughout Revelation? You're going to see smoke. You're going to speak. You're going to see lightning and thunder. You're going to see fire. Now, the the vision here of when God comes is pure terror. Let, let's look at one other passage. We don't. We can't go to all the passages that I had. What time is it now? Is, are we running out of time? Okay. Yeah, we're, we're 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 getting we're getting low on time. Okay. So I just want to read one passage here. Look at how the New Testament describes. Exodus 19. This is from Hebrews. This is from Hebrews. So, you know, I hope you're seeing connections here. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 18. If you're, I'm getting goosebumps right now. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, darkness and gloom, and a storm. Tempest is storm. Exodus, this is quoting literally the event on Exodus 19. So the author of Hebrews, who I say is Paul, um, says, you have not come to what can be touched, blazing fire, dark, gloom, a storm. So in the book of Hebrews, the understanding of the cloud was, uh, was this terrible, terrible storm. The sound of a trumpet and the voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages should be spoken to them. They were so afraid of the voice. They heard the voice of God. They said, don't let him speak anymore. Who's the living word? <laughs> Who's the living word? Jesus Christ. If they were terrified when God spoke in this theophany in the Old Testament, in the coming in the Old Testament, how much greater when that voice comes in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, your homework is going to be to read Revelation 1, 9 to 20. Um, I'm going to read it, actually. I'm just going to read it. So let's finish here. Can you give the passage again? Where are you okay, reading? I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 and following, okay? So let me read this again, and then we're, I'm just going to go to Revelation so you can see this. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages should be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. Even if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. This is what is happening in Exodus when God descends in a cloud. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable angels and festal gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn who is enrolled in heaven, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of not the old covenant, the new covenant. We're part of this new covenant. And to the sprinkled blood that speaks better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when he, they refused him who warned from earth, how much less shall we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven? They will wail on account of him. They will wail and mourn on account of him. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more, I will not Shake the earth only, but the heavens. That things made in order that things that cannot be shaken will remain. Therefore, let us be grateful in receiving a kingdom. <laughs> he has made you a kingdom, priest of our God. 
Let us therefore be grateful to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. I hope you're seeing this. Exodus 19, Hebrews 12 is revealing the revelation and commentary on Exodus 19. Revelation is picking up on it and actually describing the coming of the Lord. Let's go now to one other passage, and we're going to conclude on this. We're, we're concluding soon. I'm just going to read it. Look at the, the vision of the vision of Jesus in verse 9. This is, this is the, this is, so we just have the preceding context. We're not going to study. I'm just going to read it, okay? But look at how Jesus is described. So I read for you Exodus 19. I read for you Hebrews 12. Look at Revelation 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, the kingdom and patient endurance that are in Jesus Christ was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet. <laughs> Goodness. Mm. Right in yeah. a you see, right what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. On turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. His hairs were his the hairs of his head were like white wool. Whoa like snow. His eyes were a flaming fire. Look at the parallels. His feet were burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth, right, the, the voice that shook the mountain, they were trembled, they were terrified to hear the voice. The mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. He laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. We're going to go back to our context and see who is the first and the last. Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death. And Hades, the firstborn from the dead. <laughs> Look at the connection. Mm -hmm. yep. Right there for, and you can go on. But what I want to see here is that the coming should ter We have grace and peace. It should not terrify us, but it should concern us. It should give us assurance, but it should terrify everyone who is not in Christ. Mm -hmm. This passage mm -hmm. here should absolutely terrify behold he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those whom he pierced and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him yeah. that should terrify everyone who is not in christ now let's conclude i want to conclude here by coming down to this part uh, i am the alpha omega says the lord god who is and who was and who is to come the almighty all right. Now, this to me sounds so strange. Like, why would you go back to referencing God the Father? And actually, when you go to most, if not all the commentaries, except for a few, everyone says that this is a reference. This is a reference to uh, God the Father. But, but for me, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Because the whole context is Jesus coming. Jesus the Son coming, who is God, and the God the Father is up here, but the accent, the accent is on Jesus. So why does he just come back and cite this Old Testament passage? This is an Old Testament reference uh, back to um, Isaiah. Uh, this is re refer referring to Isaiah and others, right? It doesn't make sense to go back to just say, I am the Alpha Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come. You know, like, what is the significance? This kind of seems out of place to me. Unless, un unless 
This is not a reference to God the Father, but a reference to God the Son. Then this is the strongest passage in the New Testament calling Jesus Christ God himself. Because the Lord God in the Old Testament is, is, a, is, is, uh, is now being called Jesus himself. Now you're going to be like, okay, Tim, that's a little bit hard. That, that, that's a little bit, you know, most commentaries don't identify this, okay? But look here. Uh, he who is and who was and is to come. Now, I'm looking at this word, and when you actually look, <laughs> this is crazy. When you look in the Greek, and this is, I am so disappointed in translations. Who is and who was and who is to come. You know what this literally is translated? Literally, the coming one. I about blew a gasket. And here's the saddest part. I've translated this many times in, in seminary, and I've missed it. i missed it. The one who is, it should be the Lord God, the one who is, the one who was, and the coming one. Oh, my goodness. My head's going to explode. Who is coming? Who is coming here? Jesus. Jesus is coming. Jesus. Look at Revelation. Revelation. Revelation 117. Fear not. All through Isaiah 40 to 66, God, the Lord God is saying to Israel, fear not. Now Jesus says, fear not. I am the first and the last. Amen. First and last. Big, ginormous takeaway here. This reference here is the climax, not an aside going back to God the Father. All glory be to him as well. I'm not taking away from God the Father. I am accenting and giving glory to God the Son. This is the climax here. Behold, Amazing. Jesus is Behold. coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. I, Jesus, am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is the coming one, the Almighty. The strongest reference to Jesus being God himself in all of Scripture. I'm going to, I am committed to this now. I am committed 100% to this. Amen. So let's let's talk. Amen for that, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's a big confirmation. That is a big confirmation in that. Yeah. Yes. So it's it's nine forty seven, and I've been talked too much. Okay. So let's let <laughs> let's think about here. Let's think practically. Okay. I just want everyone can talk. I am not going to talk. I'm just going to write down your your observations and comments. Let's reflect upon this incredible truth. And what is your, what is our reaction? We will tremble when Christ will come back. It will be, I think it will be a scary thing. <laughs> it can't even face the Lord because of the blazing, blazing uh, eyes and the description itself. I think we cannot face him because of his holiness. No, this is great. So this is, this is our, this is our reaction. So, Beth, what were you saying now? I'm saying what Ronnie's saying would go along with, will our response be similar to the way they responded in Exodus? Right? Or, I mean, in both of these passages. No, excellent. So let's do this. Similar to Exodus and also to Revelation 1, 9 to 20, right? John's reaction is just to fall down, and he's trembling in fear. That is, our re that is a natural human reaction when we're around pure power 
but what should this move? That's our reaction, but what should be our subsequent response? We will not be able to stop. I agree with, with, with Bethany and with, with Ronnie that no matter, that is going to be our reaction. What will be the subsequent or what should, what should be our subsequent? Go ahead. I have a question in verse seven of Revelation, right? He says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. I was just thinking, if this happens in the rapture, we will, we will, I think we don't belong to those people who will mourn, because we will be the Lord now, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So yes. Is only those who are the unbelievers. Yes. Excellent point. So... So the old peoples there doesn't include us because we already been raptured and we'll be with Jesus. We'll meet him in the clouds actually, right? Yeah, so let's, so let's, can we have a, uh, let's have, let's, th let's table that question. Let's discuss it next week. But that is an excellent question. Let, let, let's, Let's at least say here, mourning and wailing does not apply to believers. And I agree 100% with that. Yes, that's an excellent observation. I don't want to say it's a question, Pastor. That's an observation. Excellent. So let's, let's discuss the, the question on the relationship of the rapture. And let's, can we discuss that next week? Sure. Yeah. But 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 our, but I agree with you absolutely. Um, uh, yes, we will not be present. Um, uh, I, let's make a clarification. We will be present, but we won't be those mornings. So so let's 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 have that discussion. Maybe you disagree. Maybe people disagree there. I would say that that we would be present, but we would not be 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 mourning or wailing. Okay. Um, but that just opens a can of worms that we just don't have the time to discuss. Uh, today. Uh, great statement, Pastor. Excellent. Um, we will not be the ones mourning or wailing. L let's, let's add, why should, so even looking at the context here, I'm looking at Revelation, why is it that we should not, we're not the ones that are mourning or wailing? We're no long, there's no more condemnation for the believers. That's correct. Now, connect that Atilani in the context. Where do you see there's not condemnation? In Revelation 1 to 8. Verse 6. No condemnation. Okay, go ahead. Verse 6 said, He has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. Yeah, yes. He loves us. He has freed us from sin by his blood. So we are no longer condemned and experience that. Just like with John, our initial reaction to the coming of Jesus is one of fear. That's a natural reaction as John had, okay? Um, and even as Hebrews warns that, that, that we need to listen to him who's coming back in judgment, okay? But we are a kingdom of priests. So that, this is where our assurance, we have been freed by his blood. This is, this is the assurance of the gospel, okay? And so in, with the coming of the Lord, there is a natural reaction for us, even those in the church, to be fearful. Look at, right, John is, John is an apostle of Jesus. He sees him. He falls on the ground trembling in fear, and Jesus says to him, do not fear. So, so regardless of our position when we come into the presence of God, our initial reaction is, going to, is one of fear because of the, the pure power, okay? But the assurance of the gospel is that, no, you are a kingdom, a kingdom of priests to our God. You have been freed by his blood. All right? Amen. So I want us to see here, this is why it's important for us as things happen around in the world, 
as, as the world rages, as the nations rage against God, as, as, as God will be bringing his judgment upon the earth, we should not have a spirit of fear, although in the moment, our reaction. So in the same way that anger rises up within us and we have to control it, fear, a natural reaction to God's judgment, a natural reaction to terrible things happening around us, that's what it means to be human. There is this reaction of fear that rises up within us. And what keeps that in check, what is our assurance is that we are in Christ. We are in Christ. Okay? Anyone else want to add? It's late. I'm sorry. I, I hope that this is that, that, that this is uh, making sense. Um, if you have questions, write down your questions. Uh, let's discuss the next week. Let's discuss the rapture question next week. Um, because because I, 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 I agree that that uh, that we are not part of the the, the morning category. Um, the emphasis here upon upon the um, where is this here here I was not meaning to say that we are part of the morning category but that we are part of the seeing category does that does that make sense mm -hmm. everyone will see him we will everyone will see him so so uh, um, let's finish this study next week at least what I want us to see here is that this coming is um, is a uh, so foundational to the rest of the book of Revelation. What I want us, what I'm going to argue here is that Revelation one to verse eight sets up the context for everything that is to come. Okay, the entire book of Revelation is then an expansion upon He is coming in the clouds. Every eye will see Him, and every, even those who have pierced Him, all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of Him. Um, uh, even the reference, the doxology to him who loves us, freed us by our sins, uh, from our sins by his blood, made us a kingdom, priest to our God, to glory, dominion forever. That is part of it. The end of Revelation is him actually receiving glory forever and him actually reigning forever. So all of these themes, this is like the blueprint by which everything else will be explained. Okay. And, and, and we do want to discuss the question that, that, that Pastor brought up and going into more details of, of, of the coming, okay? Any other questions or comments? I don't want to take anyone else's time away. Um, I, it's a I, good study. I think what I, I got from here is, uh, yes, we are in Christ. Yes, we are assured. Yes, we are, we are secured in Christ. But at the same time, we must not take uh, lightly that God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, although we are assured, we are, yes, we are secured in Christ, but we should fear him, like we should tremble, you know, like, uh, you know, you, we must be, tremble in, in his presence. That's what I'm saying. It's not, don't take him lightly, you know. And I think on mm -hmm. that verse 7, when... Uh, when every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, I think in my own, it's like we will really, the, all the people will really see who he, who he is. Even those who pierce him that don't, didn't believe him, yeah. they will really see who he really is. Yeah. The Lord God, you know, the, the consuming fire. So that's, I think that's what I, my takeaway on this one. Amen. Excellent. Excellent bringing together, Pastor. I couldn't have said it better. I will turn it over to Pastor. One last thing I do want to say. Um, this is turning out a little bit more detailed than I had anticipated, but, but I want us to have a commitment here. We're all Christians. We're all mature Christians in Christ. Let's not be American and have a timetable. <laughs> okay? Let's take our time. Um, Let's, Amen. Let's, let's explore other avenues, even if this takes us a long time. I think that we'll be going to other places of Scripture. 
let's just not rush. I'm not going to rush. And let's all go together slowly. And um, if it takes us a long time, who cares? We are, this is the greatest blessing. Blessed are the ones who read aloud the words of the prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and keep. So we're in a great place to take our time and just let the word of God speak. And again, if we read it doxologically, if we read it theologically, if we read it exegetically, if we read it canonically, if we read it evangelistically, if we read it practically, we're doing everything that we should be doing in a small group. So let's take our time. Let's, let's not rush. Um, I am loving this study. I am learning so much. I, I, I want to say that I'm probably learning just as much as you, if not more. And um, everything I say is not from this place of, oh, I know this or that. I literally, I am learning, even from your feedback, I am learning things that I had not seen before. So this is really a study. We are on this journey together. And um, with that, I'll turn it back to, to our fearless leader, Pastor. <laughs> fearless, That's no, good. I fear. I fear the Lord. I fear my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank, Thank you.